Early February, 1968. Hessel Road, Kingston-upon-Hull, Eastern England. A knock brings a housewife to the door. The port missionary greets her with a solemn expression and respectfully removes his hat. He asks to come in. This wasn't his first visit of the day, and it wouldn't be his last either, for this community had been rocked by not one, not two, but three separate ships sinking in rapid succession. Only one man would survive. Today, Descent into Darkness explores the tragic three weeks that rocked the entire British fishing industry and led to a massive public campaign for reform in The Whole Triple Trawler Tragedy. Background As some of you may remember from my video on the sinking of the Gaul, deep-sea trawling in the North and Arctic seas are amongst the most dangerous jobs in the world. The chances of ever sailing in a flat calm are as rare as rocking horse shit. It is renowned for its harsh conditions, with strong waves and foul weather where the freezing rain feels like being sandblasted in the face. Consequently, the men who sailed, and still do sail these waters, are a breed apart from other men. Hard as nails and strong as oxen, they work in all weathers and risk their lives to bring home their catch. No doubt a lot of you are familiar with the TV programme Deadliest Catch, and will have seen the awful sea conditions that they have to work in. The North Sea is not too dissimilar in its ferocity. The risks are great, but so were the rewards and it was this that kept generations of men coming back for more. A good voyage could see the trawler crews paid small fortunes for their catch, which they would then take home, give their wives a chunk of the money for housekeeping, etc. They would then get bathed and changed, and immediately head out. A first stop for many of these fishermen would be to one of the many tailor shops to get measured up for a brand new suit to be made for them. Once this was ready, they would go out on the lash around the pubs, splashing the cash and getting totally plastered. After only three to five days ashore, it was time to go back out again for another two to three week voyage. Many of them would turn up on the dockside still dressed in their sharp new suits, although by now they were virtually spent up. This led to trawlermen in all British fishing ports such as Hull and its local rival port of Grimsby to be nicknamed Three Day Millionaires. They partied hard, but they worked far harder. Not only was the deck of a trawler pitching up and down like a seesaw, but it would be slick with water and fish guts, and even more dangerous, ice. Ice had the ability to build up extremely quickly due to freezing rain coating every square inch of the superstructure and even the mast, cranes and wires. This could lead to the vessel becoming too top-heavy, greatly increasing the risk of capsizing. Of course, the crews were expected to deal with the ice build-up alongside their duties to catch fish. Fishing vessels tend to come in two flavours. Stern trawling, where the trawl gear is launched or shot in the parlance of the industry from the back or stern of the ship, and then you have the type that shoots the nets over the side, known as sidewinders. This latter type tended to be the most popular, as stern trawlers have an inherent risk of being swamped by a rogue wave due to the whole stern being open with nothing in the way of railings to protect the crew, although this was not the only reason. All three of our vessels in question today were sidewinders. The Vessels H223 St. Romanus. Built in 1950 by Cook, Welton and Gemmell Limited of Beverley in East Yorkshire, the St. Romanus, or Van Dyke as she was named originally, was 599 gross registered tons and measured 51.9 metres long and 8.9 metres in the beam. Her oil-fired 925 horsepower power plant could push her along at just under 13 knots. She had been built for the Motovirizij company out of Ostend. She had served the continent well between 1950 and 1964, when she was sold to the British-based owners Thomas Hamling and Company. The ship was no stranger to tragedy. On the 5th of May 1966, two men, 31-year-old third-hand Clive Davies and 19-year-old spare-hand Eric Fuller, were lost overboard whilst the ship was in the estuary of the River Humber 
not even yet out into the North Sea. The St. Romanus sailed for her North Sea fishing grounds on the 10th of January 1968. That evening, the last official contact was heard from her as she reported in. Only the very next day, a mayday call was received by another nearby vessel, but, disgracefully, the call was not passed on to other vessels or authority. On the 13th, another vessel reported encountering an empty lifeboat from the St. Romanus. Astoundingly, the alarm was not raised until the 26th of January, after multiple failed attempts to raise her on the radio. Company policy dictated that vessels were required to report in daily to pass on position, weather conditions and catch numbers, but it was known that the radio signals could be highly erratic in the harsh weather conditions. Then, the report reached them of the discovery of the lone lifeboat. By the 30th of January, all hope was lost of finding the St. Romanus, and the families of the crew were duly informed. H591 Kingston Peridot Straight off the bat, I know that it's supposed to be pronounced Peridot, but the people of Hull say Peridot, and so that's how she will be referred to in this video. The Kingston Peridot was built in 1948 in the same shipyard as the St. Romanus. She was not dissimilar in looks from her either. I mean, you know, why change a classic? She was 55.4 metres long, 9.4 metres in the beam, and with a 4.6 metre draft. She had a 1,000 horsepower engine that drove a single screw for just under 13 knots for her 658 gross registered tons. From her launch until 1966, the Peridot was owned by the hull-based Kingston Steam Trawling Company Limited, upon which she was sold to rival company Hellyer Brothers Limited, who were later incorporated into the larger Hull Northern Fishing Company Limited. She set sail on the same day as the St. Romanus, the 10th of January. She docked in Reykjavik to drop off the ship's cook, William Good, who had picked up an injury. Another man, Harry Riches, had flown out to Iceland to fill in for the stricken cook. Then, the Peridot sailed out for the fishing grounds. By the 26th, she reported that she was fishing off the northeast coast of Iceland, in horrific weather. She had raised another nearby vessel to assist her, as she had been struggling with the sheer volumes of ice build-up on her upper works. The two vessels agreed of a rendezvous point, but the Peridot never made it. The Kingston Peridot foundered sometime in the night on the 27th of January, off the northwest of Tjörnegrun. On the 29th, one of her lifeboats washed ashore on the Icelandic coast, empty. This was followed by more debris. The news of the Peridot became known in Hull on the 30th, the same day that the families of, of the St. Romanus had begun to receive their most feared news. H61, Ross Cleveland The Ross Cleveland began her life in the Lewis John and Sons Limited shipyard in Aberdeen in 1949. She was 659 gross registered tons, 54.3 metres long, 9.1 metres wide, and 4.9 metres draft. Her power plant could generate 900 horsepower, giving her a top speed of 12 knots. She was owned by the famous Ross Trawlers Limited under a subcontractor of Hudson Brothers. Originally, her name was the Cape Cleveland and remained so up until 1965, whereupon the Ross Company decided to rename all of its vessels with the Ross prefix in a bid to strengthen corporate identity. On the 29th of January, she had called into Reykjavik as their cook, Bill Haurik, had been taken ill and was unable to continue. She set sail again once Bill had been put ashore but a replacement was not taken on, the duties instead falling to 15-year-old Cook's assistant Michael Barnes, which must have felt like something of a baptism of fire, having to take on the whole job of feeding the crew so unexpectedly. Six days later, on the night of the 4th of February, the Ross Cleveland ran into difficulties in the awful weather. She was not fishing, wisely sheltering off Isafjordr, Iceland, but tragically, this would not be enough to save her from the vicious weather conditions, with colossal waves reported of between 30 to 40 feet. Several vessels reported hearing the last message from skipper, 41-year-old Philip Gay, whose last words were, I'm going over! We're laying over! Help me! I'm going over! Give my love and the crew's love to the wives and families! As if this catastrophe weren't enough, the British vessel Notts County and the Icelandic ship Hytherin were also lost that night, 
The Hytheran was lost with all hands. The Ross Cleveland capsized and sank in 120 metres of water in the fjord. Sole Survivor Three men from the Ross Cleveland managed to scramble into a lifeboat and get clear from the ship. They desperately fought against the stinging rain, the minus 40 degrees centigrade temperature, and the wind equivalent to a force 12, using their boots to frantically bail water from the small rowboat. One of the men, 18-year-old deckhand Barry Rogers, had no time to don any warm clothing, climbing into the boat with nothing more than a t-shirt and a pair of underpants on. He soon succumbed to the wet and freezing cold elements. The second man, 13-year-old boatswain Walter Hewitt, had been wearing a thick, warm clothing, but it was not waterproof, so it was not long before he too succumbed to hypothermia. The third man, ship's mate Harry Edam, against all odds, was able to survive, and drifted along with the strong currents for another twelve hours, before he finally washed ashore on the Icelandic coast on the 6th. He walked around for a couple of hours before finding a deserted summer house. Sadly, he could not get inside as it was locked, so he did the next best thing. He laid down on the side that shielded him best from the weather, and then, shivering to the core, did his best to bed down for the night. He was already showing the initial stages of frostbite in his extremities, and was battling the bitter cold that sapped his energy. The next day, a sixteen-year-old shepherd found Harry taking shelter and took him to get help. The locals fetched him some warm, dry clothing, fed him and watered him, before helping him on his way back to England. He arrived back in Hull on the 15th of February, eleven days after the Cleveland foundered. Back home, his wife Rita had been agonising about the news of her husband's fate, but finally the phone rang, and Harry was on the other end. The relief must have been equal to the feeling of sorrow for all of his shipmates. Upon his return home, he was interviewed by a press junket in his home, alongside Rita and their seven-month-old daughter Natalie. A few short pieces of footage shot by British Pathé are available to watch on YouTube. Link in the description. Harry would return to sea only 11 weeks after the disaster, but when one considers that the trawlers were the main employer of the area, and he already knew the job, it's not all that surprising. The Campaign Regardless of whether a fisherman's family had been directly affected by loss, the whole community bore the grief collectively, many coming together to help those afflicted households and shoulder the burdens of day-to-day -day tasks whilst the grieving process went on. Collections were had around all the other families to support those who needed it most. Community spirit was so much more widespread and heartfelt back in the good old days. Rather than wallow in the understandable collective sorrow, a group of fishermen's wives decided to direct their efforts towards changing the lot of the deep-sea trawlermen. Upon hearing the news of the loss of the Kingston Peridot, Lillian Balocca, whose husband Ernie had been on one of the ships attempting to reach the Peridot, turned to her daughter and said, Enough is enough! And along with three other women, Christine Jensen, Mary Deness, and Yvonne Blenkinsop, set about organising a national campaign to reform the safety protocols to help prevent such a terrible, preventable and needless thing from happening again. And then, with the loss of the Ross Cleveland, this only served to reinforce the ladies' point. They were, rightfully, convinced that the trawler owner companies were deliberately cutting corners to save cash, letting their ships sail with insufficient crew and outdated, defective or even absent safety and life-saving equipment. And now, Fifty-eight men had paid the ultimate price for this corporate greed. Some things never change, do they? Together, these four women formed the Hazel Road Women's Committee, Hazel Road being the main street that a lot of Hull's trawlermen lived, and it still holds a special place in the collective psyche of the city to this day. The group quickly garnered the affectionate nickname of the Headscarf Revolutionaries, due to most of the women in the area wearing a knotted handkerchief around their heads to keep their hair back whilst slogging away working. The group's demands were very reasonable and straightforward. Ships not being allowed to sail without a full complement of crew. Regular testing for radio equipment and dedicated radio operators to be aboard. Greater and more accurate weather reporting. Better training for new crew members. A mother ship with medical facilities aboard to sail with all fleets a royal commission into the fishing industry, 
12 hourly radio contact reports, and suspension of fishing in Icelandic waters during the winter months. Lillian Balocca was a tenacious soul. She could be seen standing at the edge of the lock gates on the fish dock quay, known as the Bullnose, with a clipboard. She would note down the outgoing ship's name and reporting number, and then hail the skipper to ask if they had a full complement and whether their radio was working and other various safety-related questions. If she did not get the answer she wanted, she would even, at one time on the 3rd of February 1968, threaten to jump aboard the St. Caverne, who had been attempting to sail without a radio operator. <laughs> Go on, lass, get em bloody telled. Sadly, the companies that owned the trawlers were not happy at the prospect of being forced to spend money. Again, nothing ever changes. And so, there was a lot of pushback. There was a smear campaign conducted against the group and Mrs. Balocker in particular. The media, once their staunch allies, now disgracefully turned on the group and stuck in the proverbial knife. Many articles were not so subtly constantly referring to Lillian's weight at every opportunity they got, dubbing her Big Lil. The group also received hate mail for their efforts, some of them clearly working as paid actors of the trawler owners, but some of them came from trawlermen themselves who felt emasculated that these women were speaking on their behalf. Shameful and disgusting ad hominem attacks, which is always a sign that the argument has been lost. But ultimately, their efforts were successful, and major reforms were undertaken along the lines of those outlined previously. Legacy Throughout the history of Hull's fishing industry, it is said that there wasn't a single family on Hesel Road that wasn't touched by tragedy at some point down the years. Of course, the men knew exactly how risky the job that they signed up for was, but in those days, one didn't complain about these sorts of things. He just got on with it. What today we would refer to as manning up. But this applied equally to the families on shore as well. The wives were just as tough as the menfolk, both in body and spirit. The triple trawler tragedy marked something of a watershed moment, if you'll pardon the pun, for the safety of those who go out into the frigid seas to bring home their tasty silvery cargo. Despite the pushback from the greedy owners, the wives' campaign led to a massive reform on the safety protocols with regular testing of equipment, mandatory training in the survival at sea, and no vessel being allowed to sail without these checks being carried out. Lillian Balocca and her fellow campaigners were instrumental in bringing about these changes, and they did so through sheer bloody-mindedness and a fierce determination to never give up until they won. We should all take note from people like that. You know you've made an impression when you can even push news about the Vietnam War off the front pages of the papers. Well done, ladies. You did them proud. Sadly, despite these reforms, the sea can never be fully cheated out of her ability to take life. Only six years later, the much more modern factory trawler the Gaul, also out of hull, was lost in the Barents Sea, off the coast of Norway, with all hands. I have made a full video on this disaster too. Link in the description. Gwen Walker, the widow of 19-year-old John Walker of the St. Romanus, recalled in an interview with the Hull Daily Mail, We'd been married a year and a half on the day when John was lost. I was also pregnant with our second daughter at the time. John loved being at sea, and he had ambitions to be a skipper. I know he would have made it. It all still feels like it was yesterday. A day does not go by when I don't think about John. He has been with me all the time. The worst thing was that John was not due to go on the St. Romanus as he was due to take his exams but returned a day too late from sea, so he decided to go out again. The family kept away from me the fact that the trawler had lost contact. I went to my grandma's and there was a newspaper about the trawler that had gone missing. It was then I realised what had happened. I later realised the St. Romanus must have sunk soon after it sailed, as they found a dinghy not long after. I told John just before he went away that I was pregnant, and he was over the moon. He said he hoped it was a girl, and it was. Harry Riches, the son of ship's cook, also called Harry, of the Kingston Peridot, said of his old man, "'My dad had a bad back, so he'd left the trawlers, but he didn't like his new job.' He got a call to fill in for the, inj for the injured cook on the Kingston Peridot and he jumped at the chance. He was excited as he would have to fly out, and he had never done that before even though he were 53. 
I was working in Market Wheaton when I heard another trawler had gone. I wasn't sure which one it was. When I got home, the Reverend was there and I knew something was up. I was due to get married in March and always prepared to call it off, but my mum said Dad would not have wanted that. I was devastated. It put a big dampener on the wedding. There was a place missing at the top table, and it were a very strange day. My dad was called Cockney Harry because he was from London originally. He was a real character and a brilliant dad. He was well loved and no one had a bad word to say about him. We used to go for a pint together and I still really miss him. Losing someone so close like that puts a different perspective on life. In a way, it makes you appreciate life more. You don't always remember what you have until it's gone. It doesn't feel like 50 years since it happened and it still affects a lot of people. It is really important the younger generation remembers. Mike Hookham, brother of 19-year-old Keith of the Ross Cleveland, said, It was devastating for our family. The night he went away, he asked me if I was coming down to see him off, which is what I often did, but it was cold and miserable, so I decided not to go down. I remember that time like it was yesterday. There were a lot of uncertainty, and it was quite a while before we knew the Ross Cleveland had gone down. We were glued to our televisions and radio when the other vessels went down too. The whole community was listening for news. I answered the door to the fisherman's mission as I was getting re- ready for school. I heard my mum screaming behind me because she knew straight away what it all meant. It then dawned on me what had happened as well, and it was incredibly upsetting. My mum was in a real state. We had to get my father back home and the neighbours came round to support us. Keith was a real Jack the Lad. He was pretty hard and took no messing. He always wanted to go to sea. He was a deckhand whilst on the Ross Cleveland and had already been on a number of fishing trips. I remember my brother every day of the year, and I still have a drink on his birthday on November 1st. What happened to my brother shaped my life. My dad was Johnny Hookham, who was a very well-known entertainer around Hesel Road, but the death of Keith devastated him, and he couldn't perform any more. However, I am very happy to report that at the time of writing, Harry Edam is still alive and very well. He has declined several interviews down the years, which is understandable. But it is good to know that he is doing well, and long may it continue. Lillian Belocker died on the 3rd of August 1988 at the age of 59. Two murals dedicated to her and the campaign she so doggedly led now adorns buildings in the Hesel Road area, and are a great reminder of the power of the people. Mary Deness decided on a career change, eventually becoming a school matron at Eton College. This would bring her into contact with with the young princes William and Harry during their formative years. She died at the age of 79. Christine Jensen received an MBE for her efforts towards safety. She died in 2001 at the age of 62. Yvonne Blenkinsop, now in her 80s, continues to live in Hull and was awarded the freedom of the city. The triple trawler tragedy has been immortalised in several folk songs. The one that stands out to me is called The Luckiest Sailor in Hull, written by Linda Kelly. I shall leave a link below to this song being played by the Hull-based shanty group Spare Hands. I was also highly honoured to have gotten a recording of a brilliant song dedicated to Harry Adams' plight, sang by local Hull folk singer Mally, that I took with his permission during a music session at the Minerva in Hull, a brilliant pub and a weekly session that I regularly attend. I shall end the video with this song. But before that, I shall read out the names of the poor souls lost in this most awful event. I shall leave a link below to the Fisherman's Mission, a UK-based charity that supports fishermen and their families in times of hardship and, perish the thought, loss. H223, St Romanus. Cyril Ashton, 39, Boson. John Brooks, Age 60, Chief Engineer. Alan Court, 17, Cook's Assistant. Robert Doherty, 16, Learner Deckhand. John Hutchinson, 19, Spare Hand. Ronald Jackson, 20, Spare Hand. Raymond Mearns, 34, Mate. Alan Nicholas, 36, Third Hand. Herbert Pye, 52, Fireman. David Redfern, 20, 
Spare hand. John Roberts, 19. Spare hand. George Rutter, 44. Second engineer. Walter Snadden, 40. Fireman. David Stott, 20. Spare hand. Kenneth Suffling, 18. Learner deck hand. Terence Walton, 19. Deck hand. James Wheeldon, 26. Skipper. John Williams, 20. Spare hand. Melvin Williams, 21. Spare hand. And Brian Wilson, 20. Cook. H591 Kingston Peridot. Adam Ali, 19. Spare hand. Charles Blanchard, 40. Fireman. Eugene Carney, 15. Cook's assistant. Harold Fowler, 56. Chief engineer. Stephen Giblin, 21. Spare hand. Alfred Hartley, 49. Second engineer. William Helas, 20. Spare hand. Martin Larson, 39. Radio operator. Leonard Leddingham, 42. Spare hand. Peter McGowan, 20. Spare hand. George Matfin, 23. Spare hand. Henry Riches, 53. Cook. Robert Rivet, 25. Spare hand. George Rose, 35. Third hand. Peter Smith, 31. Mate. Robert Smith, 20. Spare hand. Kenneth Swain, 24. Learner deck hand. David Worley, 16. Learner deck hand. Enoch Watson, 44. Boson. Raymond Wilson, 33. Spare hand. H61, Ross Cleveland. Michael Barnes, 15. Cook's assistant. Kenneth Brantman, age unknown. Second engineer. Philip Gay, 41. Skipper. Douglas Hairsign, 45. Spare hand. Alan Harper, 24. Third hand. Walter Hewitt, 30. Boson. Keith Hookham, 17. Spare hand. George Keel, 63. Fireman. George Ketley, age unknown. Spare hand. James McCracken, 17. Spare hand. Dennis Mays, 42. Chief Engineer. Malcolm Morris, age 21. Spare hand. Maurice Petman, 30. Spare hand. Barry Rogers, 18. Spare hand. Frederick Sorden, 50. Trimmer. Maurice Swain, 22. Spare hand. Roland Thompson, age unknown, radio operator. And Trevor Thompson, 18. Deck hand. I on the storm-torn coast of Iceland February 68 Ross Cleveland out of holy hiding With anxious eyes her skipper waits Storm Force 10 and the black ice building Blinding rain and the radar gone On the cruel rocks of Issa Fjord She'll be thrown before the dawn Tries to run for the eastern seaboard 
turns her head into the gale. Harry Adam leaves the wheelhouse, steps into that howling hell. Down to a grave in the icy waters, down to a grave in the cruel sea. Over goes the good Ross Cleveland, ten seconds to eternity. Out on a raft in the boiling waters, biting winds cut like a knife. Two men freeze and die beside him as Harry Adam clings to life. Morning comes and the raft is grounded. Three men lie as made of stone. Then at last there's life returning. One man walks the shore alone. Cold are the shores of the Isafjord, harsh and bare her rafty crest. All day, all night, walks Harry Adam, a dead man if he stops to rest. In the misty light of an Iceland morning, over rocks in the driving rain, shepherds find Murhari Adam back from the dead to sail again. I think it's <laughs>
A huge thank you to my current patrons, all of whom are the real heroes of DID, keeping the lights on and the flame of inspiration burning bright. And of course, don't forget to like DID on Facebook as well to ensure that you never miss a new episode. Link below. And if you can't get enough of YouTube's foremost silky voice narrator, head on over to my alternate channel DID Reads to hear more. And in the meantime, take care of yourselves, and I shall see you on our next descent into darkness.